today I'm going to discuss following up on Sam's talk, product development considerations for generic topical products. And the way we chose to approach this presentation is by walking you through some of the considerations or some of the aspects of a drug product that we take into account when we develop a product specific guidance with the, with the thinking that that may help develop a product development plan or, uh, or also influence the type of information that you may choose to include in a product development meeting package that is then submitted to the agency for uh, interaction. So I'm going to begin by talking about uh, one of the first things that we think about when we get our RLD uh, one, uh, and once we understand uh, the uh, different aspects of the RLD is to try to figure out or identify what are the potential regulatory pathways that are available to us for establishing BE for say a given topical product. Is this product a topical solution and can it indeed qualify for a waiver of in vivo studies or is the bioavailability essentially self-evident? Is it a corticosteroid product? And can bioequivalence be established using a vasoconstrictor assay, a pharmacokinetic study? Um, of course, comparative clinical endpoint studies is always an option. And we have heard a lot about this yesterday from Dr. Cook's talk and all the other talks that have uh, talked about uh, how this, although it's available and a lot of topical dermatological products that are currently on the market were approved using this mechanism this may not be the most efficient way for at least some of these products. So for the majority of my presentation today, I'm going to focus on this in vitro product characterization and, pharma, and in some situations, pharmacokinetic studies-based approach, or as Sam referred to his, in his presentation, the, mo the modular framework for establishing BE. And within the scope of that, thinking about uh, some of the considerations we take into account when we develop a PSG that contains an in vitro characterization-based approach, we think about and try to identify what are the potential failure modes associated with uh, for uh, modes for BE associated with the drug substance. For example, are there multiple APIs, and do uh, uh, does the stability of is the stability of one of the API impacted by the presence of the other? We try to identify potential failure modes for the dosage form. Is it an oil and water emulsion? And the example Sam gave. Are there globules in there that may impact the potential bio, uh, any differences in the globule size may impact potential bioavailability? We think about understanding uh, really well the mechanism and or site of action in order to clearly understand does this product really work in the skin or, or is it really applied to the skin and maybe, for example, works in the joints. And ultimately, tying all of these, uh, identifying all of these failure modes, identifying the studies that may, be, that may help to mitigate any concerns or uh, BE risks that are related to these failure modes to ultimately develop or reflect our current thinking in product specific guidances. And I'm going to go through each of these uh, steps one at a time. The first one being the drug substance, where we think about this as two distinct scenarios. Either the drug substance could be completely dissolved, or it could be suspended, where uh, you don't only have dissolved drug, but you also have particles in there. When the substance is dissolved, the way I think about it is the failure modes may be comparatively lower, but we still think about our, does this API have isomers, and if it are different isomers, and if it does, are there a difference in pharmacological activity of these isomers? The reason being, if the reference product and the test product are sourcing the API from different sources, and the ratio of those isomers are different in those uh, sources, then that could end up impacting the efficacy from the product. Another example is we think about the pK of the drug in relation to the pH of the formulation. And the example here would be if, say, for example, the pK of the drug is around 4 uh, for like carboxylic acids, and the pH of the formulation, the target pH range is between 4 and 6, small changes in that pH range could impact the solubility of the API in the dosage form, which in turn may impact the thermodynamic activity. And as Sam spoke about in his talk, any differences in thermodynamic activity in the, of the API in the formulation can impact the uh, partitioning, can impact the permeation, and thus in, in the end the bioavailability from the product. When the API is suspended, we feel there are additional failure modes for the drug product in addition to what I just described on the left. Here we also think about the polymorphic forms. And again, if there are different polymorphic forms, if the test and pro, uh, reference product are sourcing the API from different sources, 
changes, uh, this could impact the solubility of the API and again the thermodynamic activity. We also think about the particle size distribution of the drug and the crystalline habit. And what I really mean by that is not only is the size characterization of the particles important, but also the shape of the particles may be important. Through uh, the research that we have done over the last five years through the Gadufa Regulatory Science Research Program, we have learned that when um, the shape of the particle is different, when you apply the application uh, stress um, when the product is applied on the skin, it may, um, there could be differences in uh, how fast the particles are dissolving and as a result that could impact bioavailability. So some examples, some considerations to think about related to the drug substance and identifying potential failure modes for the specific product that we are developing the PSG for. Moving on now to understanding some, uh, some potential failure modes for a dosage form, again we see this as two distinct scenarios where either the formulation could be a single phase system, for example a solution or a gel, or a multi-phase system like a, a lotion or a cream like an oil and water based emulsion. And here again the failure modes as we move from the left to the right of these slides in our opinion, the failure modes uh, may potentially increase. When the system is single phase, we think about, say for example, if it's a solution and if the product indeed can qualify for a waiver of in vivo studies uh, because uh, bioavailability is self-evident, we think about if, if the generic product has exp uh, excipient differences compared to the RLD, can that impact the safety and efficacy of profile of the product? Can it impact the irritation profile, which in that case would be a potential failure mode for the product? We also greatly care about viscosity and or rheology. And, and like Darby spoke about yesterday, when it's a Newtonian fluid, maybe viscosity is enough. When it's a non-Newtonian fluid, like a lot of these topical dermatological products are, we care about not only viscosity, but the rheological profile to understand how the product, if the test and reference product behaves the same, uh, not only when you dispense it from the container closure, but when you apply on the skin. And we care about this because not only can this impact patient uh, perception, when you have a very, uh, say for example, a nice uh, thick uh, liquid for the reference product and you have a flowy solution for the generic or vice versa, that can impact patient perception, that can impact compliance, but that can also impact the amount of product that is being dispensed and applied on the skin or the surface area of the skin over which the product is being spread over. And again, that can impact bioavailability. We also think about pH. And I also already gave you that example of pH uh, in relation to, uh, 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 in relation to uh, understand, uh, understanding the solubility. Here I would like to give you an example of, say for example, differences in pH between the test and the reference formulation impacts the polymerization of say a carbomer based gel in uh, carbomer, uh, of the carbomer in a carbomer based gel or it impacts the irritation profile. So something to think about and, and measuring pH may mitigate uh, the risk associated with multiple uh, failure modes but I just wanted to illustrate how we think about the different failure modes and try to identify the potential tests that can mitigate the concerns. Moving on to the multi-phase system now. We have potentially there could be additional failure modes and Sam already talked about how the phase and arrangement of matter is really important, how the distribution or the localization of the drug in the dosage form could be important. And again, through our research through the Gadufa Regulatory Science Research Program, we have learned that when you change the homogenization speed, when you change the time, uh, it may impact, say for example, the globule size, which in turn ends up impacting the bioavailability from the dosage form. So something to think about when we have these multi-phase system and, and think about the potential failure mode for the product that we are designing uh, generic for. And lastly, remembering uh, to think about the packaging configuration. What I mean by that is even if you are developing uh, one single formulation and packaging them into a pump and a tube, say for example, again through our research we have learned that, that uh, dispensing stress that the product experiences when it's dispensed using a pump can impact uh, the characteristics of the product, which in turn ends up impacting bioavailability. So something to think about when the products is, are being designed, something to think about when you look at the reference and decide what kind of packaging configuration the test is going to be available, a test product is going to be available in. And lastly, uh, uh, understanding the mechanism and or site of action is very important in order to identify the last aspect Sam talked about, uh, is a pharmacokinetic study really needed? If the, there could be two scenarios here. 
either the mechanism of site of action is well understood and I'll give a few examples in a second or it's not. When it's understood like in the case of guidances we have for a cyclovir topical cream or a benzyl alcohol topical solution where we know the product acts on lice and does not really permeate across skin, an in vitro based, character based approach may be recommended in a PSG. However, in situations like the dapsone topical gel or the ivermectin topical cream, since the mechanism and or site of action of these products could be partially systemic, in addition to the in vitro characterization, a PK study is recommended. And this is important to consider when you look at the information in the product label or literature references to try to identify what is the actual mechanism or site of action and identify what kind of studies may be needed to uh, mitigate risks uh, associated with uh, the product for establishing BE. So through our research within the GADUFA, I'm not going to go into the scientific aspects of this uh, slide, but what I wanted to show you is we, ha we chose these reference products shown here on the green and the test, uh, test products in red. We looked at rheology, we looked at IVRT, we looked at a whole host of Q3 characterization. And finally, we connected all of these with a performance test, which in this case was a cutaneous, in vitro cutaneous pharmacokinetic technique or IVPT. And the goal here was not only to develop these tests, but also understand that if we can have these tests as a toolkit and use this test to characterize the product well enough, a product that looks the same, feels the same, should behave the same when it reaches the patient. And, and, and through our research program, we have developed these tests and, uh, and try to identify the types of studies that may be needed to, uh, to mitigate uh, potential failure modes for BE. Uh, and, and they increase, of course, as the product becomes more complex. Our current thinking is usually recommended, uh, usually, uh, is uh, ev seen in the product specific guidances. And in the next few slides, I'm going to quickly go through some of these product specific guidances to show you how the pattern of studies that are recommended uh, evolves as the complexity of the dosage form changes. There is a lot of information on those slides, and th those are mostly for reference. But my goal here is to show you the pattern. So the first one I have is a solution-based topical uh, dosage form. In most instances, as I uh, inferred before, they qualify for a waiver of in vivo study. But in some cases, we do recommend some additional product characterization, like in case of this uh, resin-based product. When we move to solution-based foam aerosols, they are still solution. If it's a solution, indeed, in, a, in the container closure system, the product may qualify for a waiver of in vivo uh, evidence for establishing BE. But we do, want, we do want to ensure that the dispensed product is also identical and as a result, we recommend some additional physical chemical characterization. Moving on now to more complex semi-solid topical product. The first example I have is the topical ointment for a cyclovir. A lot of us are very familiar with the guidance. Here we recommend Q1, Q2, Q3, and IVRT. And we have very similar recommendations here for sulfur sulfadiazine topical cream. And you may ask, I, I spoke a lot about how the complexity of a topical cream may be higher than a complexity of, say, for example, a gel or, in this case, an ointment. But the thing to remember here is it's not just the dosage form. It's the drug product. And sulfur sulfadiazine topical cream is actually uh, applied on burnt skin. So permeation across uh, intact stratum corneum using, say, for example, the IBPD study is not really relevant here. And we feel the level... The studies that are recommended in this guidance are sufficient to mitigate any uh, concerns for establishing BE. For the topical, uh, for the acyclovir topical cream, however, based on the research that we have done and a lot of data that we have on the product, we feel that in addition to Q1, Q2, Q3, and IVRT, we do need that biorelevant test and IVPT to connect the dots and mitigate all the concerns that we have, we may have for this product. And it doesn't always need to be a uh, uh, the bioRelevant test doesn't always need to be uh, uh, IVPT. In this case, for the benzyl alcohol topical lotion, again, this product acts on the lice and doesn't really uh, permeate through the stratum cornea. We actually recommend a ex vivo hair tuft assay, which is more relevant for this product. And lastly, when the mechanism of site of action is not well understood, in addition to Q1, Q2, Q3, IVRT, and IVPT, we do recommend uh, systemic uh, PK studies. And, and I hope I was able to show you that how this pattern evolves as the complexity of the dosage form uh, increases through these uh, examples. And when a PSG is available, I think it's 
straightforward. You either choose to follow the recommendation in the PSG or if you have an alternative approach, you may uh, choose to submit a control correspondence or a, a pre nda meeting request depending on the types of uh, differences that your pro uh, proposed product development plan has compared to the, uh, compared to the uh, published PSG. However, when a PSG is not available, we recommend that you identify the reference listed drug. And if you are here for Chris's talk yesterday, you know that sometimes this could be tricky as simple as it sounds. So please follow uh, the, some of the things that she mentioned in her talk to uh, identify the RLD correctly. And then identify the studies that can uh, support a demonstration of VE that is appropriate to the complexity of your dosage form of your drug product. If, however, input from the FDA is requested, we recommend submitting uh, information that is related to, uh, that contains the proposed formulation of your proposed generic product, as well as a clear outline of the BE approach. And we request this information because, say for example, if you are proposing an in vitro approach, without that proposed formulation, it is very, uh, it is not very easy for us to uh, figure out if the proposed approach may be applicable for your specific product. Um, if novel techniques are, uh, suggested in a product development meeting package, like if you choose to conduct a dermal open flow microperfusion study or a microdialysis study, we recommend submitting any information you may have related to the feasibility of that study. And lastly, thinking about the pro uh, product packaging configurations and including that in your meeting package so we can connect the dots from the RLD product to the test product. And there are some references. So in summary, I would like to say that topical dermatological products range for simple solutions to emulsions and the approaches for establishing BE are generally dependent on the complexity of the drug product. If a pre nda meeting is indeed submitted, we recommend that it should clearly characterize the complexity of the reference product. And based on that understanding, provide clear and concise information about how the proposed approach can mitigate concerns related to potential failure modes. I have some references here for the large amount of research that we have done over the last five years. And that has greatly influenced the uh, uh, the development of a lot of these guidances. I also have some references for the funding opportunities for FY18 that we are going to initiate. And with that, my acknowledgments, I would like to acknowledge Dr. Sam Rani and our entire team within the Office of Research and Standards. Dr. Rani has been instrumental in developing some of these in vitro characterization based approaches for topical dermatological products. And our, uh, our uh, uh, partners in the Office of uh, Pharmaceutical Quality as well as the Office of Biostatistics. And most importantly, our research collaborators, we have contributed greatly to gener uh, generating a lot of data that has greatly helped us move uh, some of these in vitro characterization-based approaches.